She is coming. Miss Stella is coming and giving us a update on the independent police monitoring. We thank her for joining us tonight. The pillars are formed of many organizations across the city. We come together once a week on Tuesday, have our pillar meetings, and we get ready for the following Monday. So that's just a little bit about the pillars. So we're going to move forward. I'm here as your um, as your moderator. I got to get my I got to get myself together. I was trying to click that. OK. Um, as your moderator, my name is Valerie Jefferson. I also have Ms. Brooke uh, monitoring the chat. I have uh, Ms. Betty. I have um, Ms. Lane and other, uh, I have Richard, Orissa. We have other uh, pillars on here to help me out tonight. I really appreciate y'all guys. So for further ado, I want to introduce you all to Ms. Stella Zickman. Let me know if I mispronounce your name, because I don't want to mispronounce no one name. Miss Stella Zitment. Cement. Zitment. Cement. Yeah, like the ground. Zitment. Zitment. <laughs> and I've been practicing on your name. I've been practicing on your name. I am so sorry. Oh, it's no problem. But, uh, anyway, we are so glad and happy to have you here because... Uh, our audience, our um, our committees, and our communities want to know about uh, the uh, the research for our new superintendent, police superintendent. We want to know about the police department here, and anything that you valuable to tell us, we please let us know. But we want you to start off to introducing yourself. Great. Well, my name is Stella Cement. I'm the independent police monitor for the city of New Orleans. Um, I run an independent branch of city government. We are responsible for providing oversight to the NOPD. Um, we existed long before the consent decree, and we exist because of community members, because our community demanded that our office be created to handle allegations of misconduct that was occurring within the NOPD from you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and truthfully long before that too. Um, I highlight those things because we're kind of an offshoot of the original office, which was the Office of Municipal Investigations. Um, and our office and the Office of the Inspector General were created from, um, from that initial kind of game plan. And again, through community, um, through community voices like yours. And so our office is different from the Office of the Federal Monitors. We're responsible for going beyond the consent decree. And again, we will exist long after the consent decree is over. We're a complaint intake site. We run the community police mediation program. We're on call 24 hours a day, every day of the year for any officer involved shootings or deaths in custody. We go out to the scene. We monitor those investigations. Um, we go to autopsies. We go to the disciplinary hearings. We monitor the use of force review boards. Um, we're involved every step of the way in the operations of the NOPD. We provide um, assessments, feedback, real-time recommendations, and our goal is to make the NOPD a safer, non-discriminatory workplace environment that will better serve our community and be more responsive, reflective, and representative of the community. Um, that's kind of the introduction into my position in my office. Um, I'm here tonight to mostly talk about um, some updates with the NOPD police chief search, mm -hmm. but I understand that there might also be some additional questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I welcome them. Okay, thank you. Oh, Miss Stella, we did, I, I, I didn't know all, I didn't know your office did all. Let y'all have full time, 365 days out of a year. Oh, that is awesome. Thank you so much for explaining uh, your office to us. We really appreciate it. And I'm just let everyone know this will be uh, on social media. And we usually share between between 15 or 20 uh, groups that we share it all over the city. Uh, just want you all to be aware of that. So this will be spread it out. And we truly thank you, Miss Stella, for explaining your office to us. We didn't know. I didn't know that. So thank you so much. So we want to start out with the uh, questions. Are you ready for the questions? Did you get sure, a list sure. of the questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. The first question is, has the New Orleans Independent Police Monitor included a police chief search process? Are you all included in the police process? 
If so, can you explain? Yes, that's a great question. So um, our office wanted to be involved in the process. We have been involved in the process in a very um, preliminary manner. We did meet with the consultant from the International Association for Police Chiefs, who was um, hired to be able to conduct the search for the city of New Orleans. So the International Association for Police Chiefs was, um, was retained as the vendor to be able to conduct this national search. The first component of conducting the search was identifying um, what they were looking for in a candidate. So some consultants came to New Orleans, they hosted a series of community forums in every city council district. And then they also met with stakeholders. And one of the stakeholders they met with was, was myself and, um, and Bonsail Shokambi, our uh, deputy independent police monitor. We met with the consultant, we answered the consultant's questions, which were majority about what traits, experience, leadership qualities, um, characteristics and experiences did we want out of the next candidate for the New Orleans police chief. Um, we were asked um, why candidates should want to work for the NOPD. And we were also asked about what were some obstacles that a potential candidate may face in the New Orleans market and the New Orleans community. Um, we provided that information to the consultant. We believe that the consultant compiled all of the information that they received from different stakeholders and from the community forums and surveys that were conducted, mm -hmm. and then provided those recommendations to a different set of individuals within the International Association for Police Chiefs, who then compiled that into a, a dossier, basically a, a profile that was released nationally and um, was tailored sent to certain individuals and in leadership positions across the country for them to be able to apply. We have not been engaged in the process since. Oh, oh okay. So, so the next question is though, what about the training? So if you are not in the process, I'm, I'm feeding back off of your answer. Right, right. I have a list right here, but I, I have. So if you are not in the process step by step, uh, therefore, explain to us about the training. Explain to us about the details of each person who applied for. Explain to us about racism. Explain to us about any detail that's going forward, like racism. Uh, like I'm reading from, did you get a chance to read uh, um, run uh, article that we sent. You might even yes. get it. Okay, good. Cause that's the next question I'm getting to, because you you kind of shocked me when you said that you are not part of the each process. So you all should be part of each process. That's what I'm thinking out loud. Um, my my mother tell me that my my, my mind speak too much, <laughs> but uh, but nevertheless, can you explain to us about why you are not part of each process? Have they invited you all? So um, we we don't have that information. Um, my understanding is that um, they outsource the search to this to the um, to a vendor to the International Association for Police Chiefs, and um, this is a national organization that does have their finger on the pulse of um, of law enforcement leadership of the new trends that are happening, of, um, of what different departments are looking for in police chiefs. And this is a rather common practice now nationally. A lot of jurisdictions utilize different national um, firms or organizations like this one to be able to conduct a search for them to ensure that they are um, the most competitive in the market in terms of getting um, the best candidates for police chiefs. So this is very common. Um, now to not include us necessarily in the process that could be as concerning or unconcerning as you want to read it. Um, and it really depends on how much trust you have in these vendors to be able to conduct a thorough search for the people of New Orleans. Now, all of that said, any candidate that is recommended, any finalist, should be released to the public. That is our understanding. And, um, and they will be screened by the city council. And city council is elected to be our representatives um, so you should be reaching out to your city council member um, 
to ensure that your concerns, your, um, your requests are considered in any final approval that is done and any final screening that's happening. Now, um, the city of New Orleans did issue a statement today with an update saying that they received, I believe, what was it, 36 candidates? Yeah. Um, I'll double check that really fast. Um, uh, they received, oh, I know that's, yeah, 33, sorry, 33 candidates nationally, mm -hmm. and, um, and six candidates were recommended by the IACP to move on to the next phase, which um, is going to be an evaluation process that they will conduct. And then the finalists will go to the office of the mayor mm -hmm. um, for her to be able to consider. And we don't know yet what that phase of the process is going to look like. Okay, uh, let, let's go back a little bit. Okay, now I'm, I understand that the city council represent the people, the mayor represent the people, but I was taking the impression that uh, you all represent the community, the people as well. So can you explain how you are representing the community, uh, the, the, the uh, search process? That's explain to us how you all can be our voice when we cannot go in. And we don't know what kind of question to ask. We don't know who to talk to, anything like that. Explain to us how you all is, I mean, representing the community. Another good question. So we submitted a letter to um, the mayor and to city council requesting that our office and the community be involved in what we called a collaborative search model. We wanted the community to have as many opportunities as possible to be able to provide their feedback in their own words, in their own voice to the individuals that would be making these decisions, which would not include our office. Um, but we wanted to make sure that those people heard directly from the community about what concerns them, what excites them about a new leader at the NOPD. Um, we submitted that letter in December and, um, and we received a response from the mayor. She thanked us for the feedback, but um, as far as we know, there's been no other action taken on that front other than the um, IACP conducting public forums in every city council district when they were here in New Orleans to receive feedback on what we're looking for in broad ways from a candidate. So when we met with that consultant, we provided all of the feedback that we had received from the community over a series of just public forums, different community organization meetings, um, emails, okay. uh, phone calls, anything we had received, we provided that information to the consultant. Additionally, we provided the consultant with a guide that we had created um, at the beginning of the year that kind of outlined our thoughts on the search and what types of questions, qualities, and, um, and traits we're looking for in the next leader of the NOPD. Um, now, all of that said, I really think that contacting your city council member is the best way to move forward in terms of getting more input out there. Oh. We also welcome any type of feedback to us directly, and we can also be a vehicle for providing that feedback to city council and to the mayor, especially now that we're down to some finalists. Now, we don't know who those finalists are, but we are very open to issuing another public letter to city council, to the mayor, with a list of concerns or um, requests from the community. And so we would love to receive that information, but I also think it's important that constituents reach out directly to their elected leaders and provide that feedback themselves. Because often when we say we've talked to the community, this is what we're hearing. I, I always think that it's far more credible and powerful for it to come directly from people. Okay. Okay, with, with that said, uh, how do, you all um, uh, talk with the community. How do you all reach out to the community? What are the different ways that you all speak to the community? Do you go out there and speak with them, have a meeting with them uh, uh, in their neighborhood association meetings, at the church, in their organization? Uh, uh, explain to us how the community can reach you out in public um, vendors or uh, venues. Uh, attend your meetings. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, we, we do go to community meetings. We go to neighborhood association meetings. Um, we go to non-PAC meetings. Um, we host, uh, we co-host public forums almost on a monthly basis with the federal monitors that are about updates on the consent decree where we also hear any other types of concerns or thoughts from members of our community. We have an Instagram account where you can follow us and you can talk to us directly. We also have email addresses. Um, so there's a variety of ways to be able to reach us. We do coffees with the IPM. Um, we're we're going to try to host another one this month. Um, but that said, we are a small office and, and we own that we can do way more and we want to do way more. So um, we're also open to suggestions on best ways to ensure that we're reaching as many people as possible. Okay. Oh, We've well, also you, gone well, on like you... radio shows like WBOK, morning talk shows, afternoon talk shows, and we get calls like we talk to people who are calling in. Um, and we also do podcasts like uh, different things like free shakers, anything anything we're invited to do, we'll do, because we really want to make sure that we're reaching as many people as possible. Okay, that's good. Well, you answer, you answer my second question. My second question was going to ask, how can you improve? But you already answered it. Thank you. So you are that oh my, Miss Stella. You are answering my question before I exit. We really appreciate that. Now, the next question is, uh, do you think we need another referent, uh, referendum? authorization from the city or a greater oversight decision making authority concerning the police superintendent so that's a, that's a big question um do we need another another referendum so city council can have more oversight over the nop yes um i think my answer is going to be yes can you explain, explain it, please? Yes, I can. So my, my main concern is just that with, with us preparing for the possible transition away from the consent decree, there's been a lot of concerns in the community that the NOPD is going to lose that regular accountability that occurred between Judge Morgan and the NOPD. And the NOPD had to report out on progress. They had to provide reports. They had to provide audits. And it also was a chance for them to um, kind of like publicly appear before the community and, and to answer for themselves about um, mistakes or, um, or any type of uh, slippage, but also to be able to own and showcase progress that was being made. And now that we're imagining a post-consent decree New Orleans, I think the community is concerned. We're hearing concerns from the community. How are we going to still receive this types this type of information? And how will be how will we be assured of that level of accountability? And um, and that's where we could really see um, city council, specifically the um, the criminal justice committee of city council, taking a larger role. Now they are currently hosting um, quarterly meetings where all stakeholders in the community justice field have to come together and we have to present to city council and we have to provide updates. We have to answer questions that they might have. We also have to provide um, monthly data snapshots to this committee of city council. Okay. Um, so in theory, I, I could see how this committee could get strengthened and um, and could be further developed to to fill some of that hole, some of the hole that might that might exist, the vacuum that might exist when we're no longer having regular status hearings in front of Judge Morgan. Um, now, all of that said, you know, there's a trade off. I do think that um, that that there needs to be room for the NOPD to come into its own and um, without always having to answer to someone above them and, um, and for them to be able to start implementing a lot of the ideas that they've had over the last 10 years that maybe they haven't been able to implement due to the consent decree and all of the requirements that exist around that. So um, I think that whatever accountability and whatever body is created and whatever obligations are put on them can't be so time consuming that they um, 
that they basically exit the consent decree and enter another version of the consent decree. We don't wanna necessarily see that. But we do want to see there still be a lot of ways for the community and the public to still have that open accessibility to, okay. to that agency because they, it's an important one. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I totally agree with you. Okay, when you was answer that question, I thought about something else about city councilmen. Okay, city councilmen have to confirm and agree with the mayor uh, when she choose a superintendent. But after they affirm it, do they have the authority? Can you explain that? Do they have the authority to discipline or to terminate the contract between uh, Orleans Paris, uh, the, the chief, after the mayor or uh, hired the person? Um, I don't believe city council will. Now, I do believe that city council will have the ability to initiate investigations into allegations of failure to complete their job or um, other concerns about any um, agency head, but but this person does serve um, at, at the uh, at the direction of the mayor. So it would be a um, and I do believe that this individual will be offered what what is kind of becoming standard across the country, which is a four to five year contract. So they probably will be offered a four to five year contract, which will offer them some job security that will last beyond this mayor which is something to consider, you know, um, no matter who is elected during the next election cycle, they will not be able to necessarily replace the, um, the chief of police. So, um, so they will probably have an option to have their contract extended or to reapply for their job to be reappointed. But, um, but in theory, their, their job will be more or less protected unless they take some action that, that shows that they have failed to live up to their, their duties and their responsibilities, in which case they could be removed. Um, but I, I think only the mayor would be able to ultimately execute that decision. Yes. That's, I, I just want to make sure that, that's why I was thinking as well. And when I had my own personal conversation with my family and my friends in the pillars, but uh, we was thinking that as well that the mayor have the uh, uh, authority over the chief uh, of New Orleans uh, Police Department. Okay, the next question is, thank you so much for understanding and explaining our questions. Your monthly reports are incredibly detailed and clearly represent a lot of work. And you explain your your office to us. You have a lot of work to be a small office. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Stella. We really appreciate your commitment. Are there monthly reports for the months after February? There after Fe are. Okay, good. There are. And I'm happy that you brought this to my attention. And I'm actually checking our website now. I emailed our website designer and asked him to upload those reports. So I want to see if they've been uploaded already. No, they have not. So hopefully they'll be uploaded tomorrow or the okay. next day, but, but we do have the reports for March, April, and May. We're okay. working on our report for June, um, which will be uploaded probably by the end of this week. Um, but all of our subject matter reports, I believe are up to date and our annual report is also up now. So you can see our annual report from last year. Um, and we're, and we always welcome feedback on any of our reports from anyone. So if you, you know, one night just want to read these reports and send us an email and let us know what you think, please do. Oh, thank you. Thank you for updating your uh, website. We really appreciate it. Yes, of course. Okay. Next is about the morale, the uh, morale of the police department. How do we change the morale of the police force and improving the intention of our police? So... That's, an, a million, that's a million dollar question that's getting asked across the country. How do we improve the morale of police officers? Because we believe if we improve morale, our retention rates will improve. That officers tend to want to stay where they're treated better, where they're happier. Um, that's a really hard question to answer. So the Fraternal Order of Police worked with Council Member Moreno and they conducted a survey of officers. And we do also have exit surveys that officers and civilians complete when they leave the department. And we use all of that information to try to get an understanding of what it is to be an NOPD officer 
And if there was anything that could have been done differently to have retained that individual. And um, what we're hearing is a, is a variety of things. What we're mostly hearing is that officers are happy with their direct supervisors, but that there is sometimes some unhappiness with leadership on a higher level. There's frustration with hours, there's frustration with workload, with equipment being out of date, and, um, and there's kind of frustration with just being asked to do too much with too little all the time. Um, and then I think across the country, there is a general frustration with, um, with, I think, attitudes changing perspectives towards police officers. And we hear this all the time on a national level, um, you know, as people push back against ideas like qualified immunity or as um, different movements like Black Lives Matter start to question um, officer accountability. Some officers take that as, um, as personal attacks. You know, here in Louisiana now, um, being a police officer uh, makes you a protected class. Mm. So if you are targeting a police officer in a crime, that could be classified as a hate crime. Um, so I think what we're hearing from that type of perspective is that officers feel um, victimized. And, uh, and I, I mean, I don't know if I, I agree with that assessment. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a lot of workers in a lot of different fields that feel victimized. Um, and I think there's a lot of generalized frustration um, in our society. And I think some of it is, is maybe unique to being a police officer and some of it is not. But I do think it's important to acknowledge because we're never going to, um, to understand what we need to do to retain officers without understanding all the different components of what goes into um, these individuals' decisions to leave the police department. So we are hearing a variety of ideas on how to get officers happier. Now, a lot uh, the easy answer is more money. But also some other answers are teaching officers about how much money they're actually making. This is a suggestion that we've provided to the academy that they've taken, which is financial literacy classes. So that way officers actually understand how much money they're, they're actually receiving for their work, they're receiving for overtime they can make through secondary employment, but also how many programs exist both on a state level and a national level for loan forgiveness and for other types of benefits that might not be part of their decision-making and might not be part of what they understand their income to be. Because if you are qualifying for all of these different programs that are providing you assistance, those are benefits that um, should be considered when you're thinking about how much money you're actually making. You're making more than you may realize you're making because you're qualifying for all these programs. So you're paying less in student loans, or maybe you're getting assistance with buying a house. So these are things to consider. Um, along with like child care assistance and everything else. Um, we also want to make sure that officers have access to as many training opportunities and programs as possible on a national level, because those are things that keep officers happy. Being able to access training and upward mobility to be able to be promoted and to be considered for specialized units. Specialized units are very attractive um, workplace opportunities because one, it makes you um, more attractive as a candidate for leadership. We want to see that you worked in homicide, that you worked in internal affairs, you worked in special victims units, that you got to run plat platoons, but also um, it, it's interesting and keeps people interested in the actual craft of being a police officer to learn new skills, um, to receive new certifications. Um, and we want to make sure that every officer has access to those things. New Orleans, um, the NOPD, is one of the signatories of the 30 and 30, which means that in um, 2030, we want to see more than 30% of leadership opportunities go to, to women, and, um, and particularly women of color within the police departments. We really wanna see that women are um, getting considered for these leadership opportunities and women of color. And we wanna make sure that, um, that women are able to access um, all of these specialized units that, that are kind of in some ways the funnels that lead to those leadership opportunities. Um, so these are the types of things that we think in, um, improves officer morale 
um, knowing that they have a future, knowing that that future is one that's going to have a lot of financial opportunity, but also a lot of interesting opportunities for them to develop as a person and as a leader. And then finally, I would, I would also say, you know, better equipment, better work hours, and just more staff in general always improves morale. You did it again, Ms. Stella. You answered two questions with one answer. You did it again. You did it again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because my next question about training, but you already answered the question about training. And I thank you so much. Um, okay, the, the last question, Brooke, get ready uh, because I'm going to ask you to read the question out of the chat for me. This is the last question, um, Ms. Stella. What things that was on your original to do list? Uh, you think that need to be added or you need to improve it or you need to, uh, you haven't seen no results from it, uh, uh, no accountability from the police department. Uh, can you tell us about your to-do list that you think need to be added, things that need to be added on there? Hmm. So, um, I mean, just, just the feedback right now, I mean, making sure that we're, that we're, finding creative ways to engage our community for us, for our office, creative ways to engage our community. Um, so that way people can provide us more feedback directly into what they want to see out of the NOPD, but then find more ways to show the community that we've taken their feedback and we've provided it to the NOPD. So um, we want to make sure that we're, we're kind of reporting out to the community about what it is that we're doing. Our um, Instagram account has been one way that we've been trying to do that. But um, we're trying to find more ways to make sure that the community knows what it is that we spend our days doing. Now, just in general for our to-do list, I mean, it's it's huge. I don't know if you can see all these colorful <laughs> cards behind me, but this is like <laughs> stuff that we're currently working on based on department and team. And, um, and right now we're doing a lot of case reviews. We're doing a lot of policy recommendations. That is a big thing. So the NOPD is currently in the process of, of going through annual revisions of all of their policies. And they have convened a policy advisory group. We are on that policy advisory group. One of our big goals is for us to start hosting a public forum in the weeks leading up to the monthly policy advisory group, where we tell the community what policies are under review and get feedback from the community about those particular chapters. And then we are able to provide some of that feedback in that policy review session that's held that month. So that's one of our big goals that we want to start doing. This group just started convening in June. And so we want to start getting this off the ground. Um, the other thing is we hear this is going to be an active hurricane season. We just sent our oversight plan for hurricane season to the NOPD for comment. So it's not ready to be released to the public yet. But our goal is to release it to the public by the end of this month. And we would like to hold some forums with the public about how policing changes during hurricane season and during nat nat um, natural emergencies. So that way the public feels equipped for those changes and understands what it means. We don't want to hear words like anti-looting protocol or curfew and have um, members of our community get alarmed. We want them to know what that language means and how that changes their engagement with the NOPD. Um, we're, we're trying to get more into appeals to understand why civil service and the fourth are overturning discipline that's happening within the police department. So that way disciplinary decisions are more thoughtful and, um, and can be upheld on a larger scale. We're always trying to look at lawsuits and claims around the NOPD to understand how decision-making that's happening within the department is, um, is affecting truthfully their budget. Um, and if there, are, if there are decisions that are being made that um, are putting the public at risk and opening the NOPD up for liability, those are things that, that the NOPD needs to know and make part of their um, risk assessments. And I do believe one question we didn't get to go into as much was about um, how we're trying to get the NOPD to focus on the idea of inherent and explicit bias and racism and undoing racism, which is so vital. So we provided a recommendation to the Academy Director of the NOPD that, that all officers go through a community-based training on undoing racism. Our office has historically engaged with the People's Institute on that training, 
But if there's other trainings too that you would like us to be aware of, please let us know. But we would like to see more officers engage in the community for those types of trainings. And I know there was a question about EPIC. EPIC is more than just training. EPIC is like a program concept. EPIC, it, it requires um, and encourages officers to report misconduct that they witness. And it also promotes and pushes officer health and well-being. And in theory, it helps officers avoid mistakes. Now, EPIC was pioneered here in New Orleans, and then it was taken to a national level by the law firm that was retained to be our federal monitor, Shepard Mullins. Um, and they work with, I believe it's Georgetown, and they um, and they provide this now on a national level, and they do it as as able, and so that stands for active bystandership of law enforcement project, and it's through the Center of Innovations for Community Safety. So um, these types of programs are popping up now, um, and are kind of modeled off what we have here in New Orleans. But that's not really what we would use as an example of like undoing racism or an anti-racism training. Now, I, I do think that um, in May of 2022, the president um, issued an executive order on advancing um, policing accountability and criminal justice practices. And a component of that was requiring anti-racism training for our police departments and more guidance from federal agencies about what that type of training looks like. Because we really don't know, like we say, you should go through this type of training, but we don't really have a clear national model about what that training looks like. So the Department of Justice through the COPS program, Community Oriented Policing, they issued a training that they offer online and it's called like Tolerance, Diversity and Anti-Bias Training. Um, so it's an online training program. We have no results yet from that training. We have no idea how effective that training is, how many people are using it, and if it's really changing any type of policing strategy or policing impact in any type of um, way that would communicate racial differences or disparities. Um, we also are aware that the nonprofit, the Anti-Defamation um, League, they offer like a full day managing biases training to a lot of law enforcement agencies across the country. And there has been some um, surveys done on officer actions and officer behavior after conduct after participating in some of these types of trainings. Um, I think the biggest one was done on the fair and impartial policing curriculum that was offered with the NYPD. And so far we're seeing some mixed results. Truthfully, we're not really seeing that these trainings, while they change minds and thoughts, like officers leave and say, I never thought that way, or I have a lot of interest, that, that, introduced me to a whole new idea. I didn't know that before. We're not actually seeing that trickle down into any definitive change in who's being stopped or frequency of stops or um, who's being searched or where misconduct is happening. We're not really seeing that yet. And, and it's hard to say if, if it's just too soon or if these trainings are enough or... Um, how to really, there's no clear answer is really what I'm trying to say. Everyone across the country is asking similar questions though. Accountability. When I'm listening to your answer, I'm thinking about one word, accountability. So uh, uh, are you aware of, or do you, can you tell us about do the New Orleans Police Department have quarterly training, mentally and emotional training, um, physically how they, arrest the person? Do they do their quality or they just only have training when they hired or when they go through their training before they get hired? That's one. And the, the second part is accountability. Are they accountable of, of how they arrest a person or how they speak to a person or or how the, on the complaints? Uh, when they do the full investigation on the complaints from a citizen, are they held accountable? Can you tell us? Yes. About so the answer is they go through trainings all the time um, and they have to go through trainings at multiple times throughout their career. 
And there's a lot of different ways that new information is provided to them through trainings or through roll calls. So that means like before they go out on their shift, there might be like a mini training that is offered. So they're always being trained and they're being trained at, at a at a pretty high frequency. Um, our office actually provides a weekly training on active listening skills to the NOPD Academy. So we provide that right now to new supervisors. It's taught by Jules, our mediation director. So, um, so we've gotten some great feedback from that. So we are teaching active listening at the Academy. And, um, and I just went to the Academy just last month and led a training for um, investigators of misconduct um, within the NOPD. Okay. So they're, they're always being trained, yes. Now, are they being held accountable? The answer is yes, they are being held accountable. Now, are they being held accountable to the level that you might hope they're being held accountable? That's a harder one to answer. They're being held accountable in accordance to their disciplinary matrix. Now, the disciplinary matrix if they deviate from the disciplinary matrix, that's something we're going to be looking at critically um, to see if they're if they're trying to give officers less discipline than what they're required to give. But for some people, the way that officers are disciplined is just not enough. Um, as if you went through an experience and you felt like an officer was extremely cruel to you, hearing that they got a letter of reprimand might not feel like enough for you in terms of discipline. So um, we're trying to kind of bridge that gap. And, um, and we are looking critically at the disciplinary matrix and at the way that complaints are classified to see if they're being classified in a way that enables them to receive less accountability and less discipline. So for example, if you say that officer was racist, that officer used a racial slur to me, towards me, and it was so unprofessional. We want to make sure that that is classified as discriminatory policing and not as professionalism. Because yes, that action that was taken was unprofessional, but it was discriminatory. So we want to make sure that the officer is, is um, potentially investigated for, for both levels of that allegation, not just the fact that it was unprofessional or similarly like if an officer you know if you say that officer like really roughed me up they were so rough with me they were like throwing me against a car and everything else it was unprofessional or it was like you know it was so rude we want to make sure that that officer again isn't investigated for courtesy or for professionalism but more is investigated for the use of force okay Thank you, thank you so much. I wanna turn you over to Ms. Brooke. Ms. Brooke, go and ask the question from the chat, please. You're on mute. Okay. You're on mute, you're on mute, yep. okay. I got it, okay. So the, I'm gonna read from my cheat sheet here. Um, The first question, and there are quite a few questions, yeah. um, is the dossier that was compiled available to the public, that's part one, and did city council screen all the candidates or only the subset of six recommended by the IACP, IAPC? My understanding is that the, the six candidates that the city does not currently have those names, that they're still within the IACP part of the screening process. So my understanding is that city council has not screened those candidates. Okay. Um, that's my understanding. All right. But the finalists are going to be made available to the public is my understanding. Okay, good. What about the dossier? So like, I don't know how much of the consultant's notes, um, all the applicant information, all of that, I'm not sure how that's gonna fall under public records law. So I'm not sure if, um, if ultimately at the end of this whole process, if like the public can then request to see all candidates, the all material that was released, the all material that was submitted. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that right now. That Thank seems you. to be a breach of privacy, but anyway. Um, I just wanted to say that the 
lower ninth ward had no such chance to talk to anyone about the what they wanted in the police chief. Now it may have been so in the east, but it wasn't in the lower ninth ward. And um, that might have been the problem, you know. I I don't want to get on a political soapbox yeah. here, but I don't really like how District E is so geographically um spread out. Yeah. Spread out. You know, it's uh because the needs of the lower ninth and the needs of the east, I mean, one, the east could be broken up into two totally separate city council yeah. or even police districts, which was one suggestion that I noticed came up in that article that I would be a personally a strong proponent of right. just because geographically and and um and just you know yeah. uh, and the public. lower ninth was yeah. uh, thought to be included in either the seventh or the or the Marini. Yeah but that yeah. didn't happen either. Um yeah. so um I think this question's been answered. We want a list of the six that are being considered and why it yeah. hasn't not been given. So we've, we've right. already answered that. Um, is there a copy of the letter that you submitted to the IAPC with the community input that you gathered from previous meetings? Okay, so um, what we provided was our was the um, chief um, guide that we created for the community and the collaborative the the request for the collaborative search. We did not provide like individual line item requests from the community to IACP in a letter format. We provided it verbally. Okay. And um, I think I know the answer to this. Do you go to community meetings as invited or proactively? A little of both. Sorry. But typically we know about things based on invites. And then we'll, we might see something on Instagram or hear about something and try to go and try to be involved. But um, it's, a, it's a mix. It's a mix. Yeah. If we, you definitely want to see us there, invite's the best way to get us there. <laughs> and I have to say that um, I'm going to butcher her name, Bon Clay. Oh, Bon Seal. Bon Seal, sorry. Uh, she came to the L9 Neighborhood Association and was quite the star. She was great. Oh, so, nice. And it was wonderful to have people there. I think you you may have come too. Anyway, um, next, does the City Council Committee on Crime, does that need to be codified so that it stays active after this council leaves? Or no. is that, no? Okay. That's like, that's a committee that just exists. And all of the requirements that we report quarterly and we provide data monthly are now, we're done under ordinance. They were done under like, so now it's law. So we have to provide these things. So now these, okay. some Perfect. stuff has been, has been codified. Great. Um, what source do you think is the most reliable and coherent for crime stats in New Orleans? Since there that's, are a lot of data sets around. That's a hard one. I think... For reliability, I'm going to have a hard time answering that. But for consistency, I'm going to say it, you should probably rely on the data that city council is utilizing from um, JNH data analytics. So just because they're, they're providing the data landscape to the city council. And so you kind of want to speak the same language that city council is speaking. So if there's a different data set that contradicts the data that city council is using, then you're going to be saying like, how come you're saying carjackings are going down and this one's saying carjackings aren't going down? I just think for consistency purposes, it's best if we all speak the same language. As for the reliability of it, I mean, that's that's a question to ask those data um, analysts, but they are relying on data that's being um, inputted by the NOPD and by other law enforcement agencies and partners. I think data inputting can be tricky, and that's an area where we're always working with NOPD to improve. And the example I always give is the way that they put in information about race. They put it in as African-American, then as Black, then as maybe uppercase B, then as maybe lowercase B, then maybe AA. So it's like you have to know that all of these different data groups actually might all be um, compiled into one data racial 
subset. And they do the same thing for white. They might have like Caucasian, white. They might have like non-Hispanic and, and mean that to mean white. So it's like, you have to look at all of this and know to yes. compile it all. And those are areas where like our data is only going to be as good as the input that you're getting. And, um, and then you want to make sure if you're looking at reliability that whoever's cleaning it and analyzing it, it's cleaning it and analyzing it in a way that you understand. Or is equitable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the next is the, the word out there um, is that, the, that, um, that a lot of NOPD are leaving because they're, they're um, the system of reward or benefits and, or, you know, raises and things like that, that it's very cliquish within the police department and the advancement, the advancement depends on who, who, you know, and who you're, who you're tight with. We've heard that too. We've okay. heard that. And, um, and that's, that's always going to be a concern for us. Also, because cliques might be a vehicle for racial preference, for right. geographical preference, for gender preference, for a lot of other types of preferences, some of which might be discriminatory, some of which might not be, but just create an insider outsider culture. Like, you know, we all went to high school in Algiers. So, you know, or we all went through the academy at the same time. So we always want to be cognizant of any type of preferential treatment um, that's happening that could exist around, you know, from where you went to high school to um, what neighborhood you grew up in. And um, we do hear, we do hear accounts of that. We do. Now, does that, um, does that point or, or lead us to think that it might be better to have somebody as the new chief of police, as somebody who's not already in the force? Um, I've, heard, I've read that, that anyway, that that sometimes is the call, you know, that when you get an outsider to come in, at least that changes the dynamics a lot. So it could, it could. And I think, um, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I definitely think that there's some people that would argue that an outsider could never understand the New Orleanian experience and could therefore never be sensitive or as as informed of um, of like the different dynamics that exist between wards, neighborhoods, or upbringing, or you know, like if you don't know the original names of schools, how could you then, you know? <laughs> understand our history so it's like I, I I get all of that um I I am a transplant and I hear it I hear it brought I mean I've lived here for 15 years and it's still brought up um quite regularly because I don't know pre-hurricane Katrina New Orleans right um so I mean there's there's definitely benefits to going outside of the department. I would say that Pennington, for example, was was held up by a lot of people as a police chief who was the full package, agree or not agree with his policing strategies, but as a full package candidate because he was a leader within the NOPD. He was like a deputy chief, and then he left, and then he ran Nashville, and he ran was it Seattle or Portland? He went somewhere in the Pacific Northwest and ran that department. And then he applied to be the police chief as an outsider. So he was technically considered an outside hire, even though everyone internally knew who he was. And that would, I think that made him a very attractive candidate to a lot of people because he knew New Orleans, but he also had had so many experiences in other police departments and other places in the country that he could draw from. So that way he was never just saying, well, that's how it's done or that's how it's always been done or that's how like, you know, this is New Orleans. We're not going to try anything new. We're going to stick with what works. Right. So uh, to answer your question, I don't know what's best. I definitely think no matter what candidate we select, we need to have someone who's imaginative, innovative, and looks to national trends and is willing to go to trainings and events on a national level and learn from other people. Whether they're homegrown or they came from somewhere else, they simply cannot be in a mindset that all you need to know is New Orleans, because that is not true. No. 
Okay, here's um, one about the comments you were talking about online, you know, the, or the comments you were talking about when you go out to the community to, um, to uh, what were you saying? Sorry. Um, you were talking about going out and getting some, um, uh, getting community or comments on, on policy revisions. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So I just wondered, uh, just personally, because I'm I do a lot of writing comments to the core and things like that in my job and in my community organizing. Um, I just wonder if there's a way to also put your things online so that people could write comments in there, you know, so that you know whatever week it is and the new policy is being reviewed that you could also add comments online. That's a great idea. Um, let me talk to our website designer and see how we do that. Um, I will add that to my post-it. <laughs> permanent marker now, here we go. Um, online. So basically it would be like online comment cards. Yeah. But um, we could maybe tailor yeah. it to a topic so people could submit them for policy or maybe even to provide us feedback on work or community requests. Right, could be okay. any. Um, Betty DeMarco asks, in our previous discussion with IPM, they suggested that once we knew the police chief finalist, the community might want to contact residents, yeah. um, residents or groups we knew in the cities where they were coming from. So yes. we could interview those. And yeah. will we, will we, will we, Will the community know the names of the finalists in order to do that? And you said, um, yes, eventually, no? Yes, eventually we should know. Yes, eventually <laughs> we should know. It's like, are you going to know with enough time to be able to do that type of legwork? Right, that's going to be the know. critical thing. That I don't know. Another question is critical that people are all trained in undoing racism. Glad to hear. Yes, yes. Dave Capasso says, Path to Union CBA pay training. The NOPD would welcome the IPM. And David, maybe you want to say more about your comment. Oh, I think he David, left. David left. Oh, okay. Yeah, but um, I mean, I I will say that like here we don't have unions; we have police associations. Yeah. Oh. And um, and the police associations, um. We we have we mostly have three, um, like two are more national. They they have like a national um, partnership, and one is like kind of hyper localized. The Police Association of New Orleans. You can belong to all three. The Black organization, the organization of Black Police Officers. It's BOP. Um, and then there's um, and then there's the Fraternal Order of Police, which is a, a big national name. Right. Um. They're involved in state, local, and in some cases, national um, issues, but um, they're not a traditional union here as you would know them to be. Okay, another comment about, um, or two more comments actually about undoing racism at training with People's Institute. Oh, good. And, so oh, that, I, and I, think, I think you've yeah. used them, right? We do, we do, yeah. and that's who we recommended. So I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, right. Anytime exactly. I'm happy, I'm happy to hear we are recommending gold. That's always Somebody where you says, want to be. It's the gold standard of, of racial training. Good, good, good. Um, and Justice and Beyond just did another training with them. So. Oh, our, oh yeah, and I see. Um, yeah, people are recommending People's Institute. Yep, yep. Yeah. But they do quite a variety of trainings. Um, yeah. Having taken many trainings myself, both mostly racially oriented trainings. I think in-person trainings are by far superior because the others you focus for sort of on getting the answer right rather than the experiential part of trainings. So when mm -hmm. you were talking about which is which, um, you mentioned you want to get more involved with appeals of disciplinary actions because of the high rate of disciplinary actions that are overturned. Please amplify what is the percentage of disciplinary actions overturned? So right now they're overturning around probably 50%, I think it is. 
uh, of uh, NOPD's decisions. So, um, and by overturning, I mean, they could also be modifying, but, um, but for the most part, they're upholding, you know, 70% of the disciplinary decisions that are being made by other agencies. So there's like about a 17% difference between the NOPD and other agencies within the city. And that's what we find kind of concerning is that difference. Like why is NOPD's decisions um, being looked at in a, in a different way if they are being looked at in a different way or why are they not being upheld at the same frequency as other agencies that are making maybe similar disciplinary decisions. Um, what we're seeing is that the civil service is often questioning NOPD's policies or NOPD's disciplinary matrix, which is um, kind of confusing because um, it's sending a real mixed message to employees. Um, I, think, uh, I think civil service, and, and this is an area we really wanna get into just because um, I, I don't know if there's a lesson to be drawn out that is always gonna be valuable to NOPD or if there's a lesson that needs to be drawn out that needs to be messaged to civil service. It's like, you know, um, that's, those are the things we're going to be asking and we're going to be looking at. That said, we're very cognizant of our jurisdiction. We have no jurisdiction over civil service, but it would be much more about kind of being like a facilitator and just saying, look, these are our assessments. This is what we're seeing. How can we ensure that um, everyone is kind of speaking the same language going forward? Okay. Um... I'm going to hold off on part two of that, I think. Um, okay. And there's another David Capasso, but David's not back, right? No. Um, is there a city where police have a union and the IPM no. is in the collective bargaining agreement? Um, Texas typically has a lot of that. Okay. Texas. So the police are encouraged to support the process, knowing it's making better policing. Um, yeah. Yeah, they and the, and because they had to negotiate it with the unions, um, the police are more likely to buy in. Right. Um, would you be over a police policy that is discriminatory, such as illegal stops and searches? Yeah, illegal stops and search in the east. Yeah, um, sixty days. There's seven jump out car searches, claiming seeing a bulge in the belt or whatever. Ah. Yeah, we want to know about that. Yeah, definitely want to know about that because that's one of the last areas that the NOPD, the NOPD is not in full and effective compliance and stop search and arrest and bias free policing. That example hits both of them. So we definitely want to know about that. I shouldn't ask, but is that more so in the East than elsewhere? Um, I can't say. Yeah, yes, you're right. We would need to look. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll say that we can't we can't definitively say that right now. Right. Okay. If an outsider could never understand the New Orleans experience, then why are we spending so much money and time looking for candidates outside of the department? Well, I mean, you know, that would be the perspective of some people would be right. that an outsider could never understand the New Orleans experience, um, and I think, you know, some people would say like. The important thing to know if you're going to run an organization that's policing New Orleanians is to know New Orleanians. Um, now, is that a knowledge that you can only be born with, or is that a knowledge that you can <laughs> learn? I mean, that's that's the question, right? And and I think I think people will fall into many different camps on that, and maybe fall into different camps on that on different topics. Good know? answer. <laughs> Jeff is asking, is that the mayor's opinion? I, I think I think the mayor has been very clear about the candidate he thinks is the most. Yeah, I, I thought so too. And but and remember, the mayor is not a native either, right? I, ironically, the mayor is not a native either. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess Sama is saying. Um, have they compelled a number of homegrown outsider being appointed since Pennington? Yes, um, we looked at that. That's on our little uh, guide that we wrote. 
question was, have we looked at how many are a number of homegrown versus outsider police chiefs appointed in New Orleans since Huntington? Yes, um, we, I did look at that. Um, and the answer is the majority of them are internal since Pennington. Um, Harrison, um, we had Harrison, we had uh, Compass, we had, um, you know, Surpass was before Pennington, and we had, um, no, Surpass we got some off. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all of them, right? And then, oh, and then Ferguson, Ferguson, right? And uh, Wood Fork. So the majority are local. The majority have been internal hires, without an external search. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So the question before that was, I think. Are we looking for someone who's willing to truly acknowledge the problematic history of policing as well? Yes. Good. We are looking for somebody who's going to understand that the police department today doesn't influence necessarily my feelings about the police department. So there's a lot of people that will say, well, today we don't have a Len Davis. Today we don't have an Antoinette Franks. Today, you know, we don't, we're so much better today than we were yesterday. But the thing is, is the people that lived through yesterday are still alive. That still very much colors your trust and your sense of the police department. And I, I'm sorry, like we need a forward thinking leader, but your forward thinkingness is never going to matter if you don't understand the history of where New Orleans is coming from and where our communities are coming from. If you're not willing to acknowledge that scar tissue that people are literally carrying, then, you know, we're not going to get too far with you as a leader because you have to understand or at least show some respect for, for, that, um, for that history because that history very much influences our trust. And it also it speaks to our triggers. Like we're gonna be very quick to be worried. I mean, like that example of the comment about jumping out of cars and everything, my first thought is jump out boys. And I'm sure everybody's thought is jump out boys. And it's like, if you're not sharing that, yeah. you have to have some of that shared um, cultural knowledge. Um, and it's not, again, nobody expects you to know everything. You could grow up here and not know everything. It's, you're not walking around like little encyclopedias, like none of us are. It's much more that you show an awareness to learn it. And when confronted with it, that you're not going to deny it and tell the community you are silly for being scared of this, or this is no longer a problem. Therefore, I will not acknowledge it. It's like, you have to be willing to learn it and, and own it. Yeah, good point. Okay. And I guess um, the last, I think the last one pretty much oh, sure. was after Pennington. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is that, uh, I, and I would guess that the answer is not every officer has taken on doing racism. No, no, no. no. Some no. percentage though. Do you know what? I, I think <laughs> some, but honestly, no. Not, not, and we've had a lot of change too. So, we've had a lot of change. Um, it's something we would like to see them do, um, and uh, it's something we would like to facilitate. I'm sorry, did you say that you don't have any idea what roughly what percentage? I have no idea. Okay, thank you. And by the time one person has a training, that person's left, and then another. I mean, it all, it all switches around. It's like, I would guess. Okay. Well, Valerie, I turned Stella back to you. And that was wonderful. You answered a lot of questions and pre pretty meaty ones. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Stella. We really appreciate you tonight. Uh, but I, I do want to ask one, though. Um, have you noticed um, NOPD or, well, it's, it's a two-point question. Have you noticed NOPD or have any 
strong interest in the next generation. When I say the next generation, by putting in the time and the money to train them for be a policeman and let them apprenticeship, um, um, let them see what's going on out there that that we so call the generation supposed to be training the younger generation how to be uh, profitable citizens, how to be productive citizens. Uh, have do you know have the New Orleans Policeman Department uh, have a strong apprenticeship? Uh, reach out to the younger generation. I don't think it's as strong as it used to be. There used to be a lot of programs in high schools and um, and a lot of partnerships. And I do think that that in some ways um, funneled a lot of interested um, candidates to the department. And I think that also might have increased trust among the among youth with um, within the department. Uh, I would like to see a return to some of that programming. And I think that NOPD is trying in some ways with midnight basketball. I know that um, individual officers are doing a lot of engagement with alumni organizations at their high schools. And they might be doing stuff on individual levels or doing it through social aid clubs or other associations, fraternities, sororities. Um, so I, I do think it, it might be happening. Um, through a lot of different mechanisms or through churches, religious groups, or just, you know, neighborhood associations. I think that there are informal ties kind of happening, but I would like to see more formalized work get done with that. And, um, and in some ways, I would like to see the NOPD reconsider some of their um, selection criteria. I know they're rethinking the question about have you ever smoked marijuana, and I'm happy to hear that because you're going to lose a lot of candidates if you ask <laughs> that question. And that's not representative, in my opinion, of anything. So I have now I'm just I'm saying a lot of stuff. But the point is just, you know, I, I just want to make sure that we're not losing good candidates because we're getting hung up on stuff that is not going to necessarily be representative of who they're going to be as a police officer tomorrow, who you were as a teenager. <laughs> is not necessarily or whatever in college or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I asked that question because that's point one. Part two of that, uh, that question is B is maybe that will slow down the carjacking, the robbery. When we put, you know, you put my peer in a positive atmosphere for me, and I'm looking at them being productive, and they coming and talking to me. Therefore, I would think twice. You know, I would think twice. Then, guess what? My peer would know what I'm doing. They would yeah. know what I'm doing, and and that's why. So, what's your take on that? That's gonna be my last question. What's your take on that? If um, have you seen that? Uh, would that work? Uh, if the, the next generation, if the New Orleans Police <laughs> Department have more input in the next generation. I know what you just said. I comprehended it quite well, but we just don't see it. You know, we still see yeah. high crime. You know, we still see yeah. <clears throat> carjack in the daytime, at nighttime, in the morning time, at the gas station. It doesn't matter. It could be at McDonald's, Popeyes. It doesn't matter. So how can the New Orleans, in your opinion, how can they improve their apprenticeship. So I think the first step is is making youth just simply feel that they're respected and heard by the police department because they're not going to be interested. No one's interested in doing an apprenticeship with an organization that that they might feel doesn't respect them. Um, so I think that um, looking to maybe Colorado, who has a very strong like youth and policing know your rights type of programming where they really get like youth and police officers in a room together and they get to have really candid face-to-face -face, hard conversations with one another about like you know stereotypes about um about what makes them angry about like you know it, like kids get to say to cops like why don't you trust me like and and it's 
some really good dialogues happen there. And I think if you start with stuff like that, then that will result in kids maybe like you'll plant just a few seeds in kids where they'll say, okay, I had a good encounter with a cop once. So maybe I'm just more inclined now to consider this as a field, but even to just talk to a police officer when a police officer goes by. Like, you know, I think if the police viewed every single person they engaged with forever as a potential informant, that would be very helpful if they realize that every single time they engage with anyone, that person might be more likely now to give them information that will help them solve crimes or information to help them prevent crimes. They have to view the community as their greatest asset in getting their job done, not as their greatest obstacle to being a police officer. And that's just a cultural difference that I think some, some police officers carry. They view, they view the community as like a hindrance, not as a help. And, and, and that goes, you know, those are moderated discussions. The question is the Colorado program with youth moderated discussion. It is, it is. There's like breakout groups. It's like a whole like three day session. We got to monitor some of it and it was very, very cool. I think they called it Lyric, um, but it was, um, it was very cool. And, um, and I do think like restorative circles, like I see community uh, mediation services has attempted to do this. Yeah, I think like, restorative circles, community circles, community um, opportunities for police officers to sit down and have candid conversations, I think are really, really helpful. Anything that humanizes police officers, I think is helpful. Honestly, I think even like, it is, people were laughing at it, but I thought some of the TikToks and some of the videos that the police were making during COVID were very humanizing. You know, it's just, it's, it's nice to see like that police are still people and that they you know yes are, are just like you and me it's like I, I think that's that's helpful and I think that helps kids then get past a mental bridge of seeing them as someone that they can talk to or maybe yes. work with yes thank you thank you appreciate uh, yes, we have Ms. Humanizing the young people of course yes, yes. of course yes yeah. Yes. Okay, we have Miss Belinda Brooke. Uh, I see two more people ask questions in the chat. We have a few minutes. Uh, Miss Belinda had her hand up. Yes. Miss Belinda, you would like to ask Miss Stella a question? Yes, I would like to ask her a question uh, when it comes to um, the high ranking officers and their um, positions to um, basically make it more of a toxic environment for police officers. You know, I'm talking about lieutenants, majors, captains, right. you know, those individuals. Um, whereas, you know, where is the top salon when it comes to holding them accountable? You know? Um, yeah. 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 And then I have one more question about are you familiar with the Ronald Green's um, death um, here in the state of Louisiana that made national news on CNN yeah. and also the cover up in regards to that? Yeah. 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 I, I think the feds are going to have more involvement in, um, in that in the coming years. And I think the Department of Justice is kind of circling uh, the Louisiana state troopers. Um, the Louisiana State Police um, over that one. Um, and I, I think the feds are also getting very involved in uses of force incidents that are happening in neighboring parishes that I know those videos kind of explode in New Orleans too and, and cause a ripple effect because they're our neighbors. So we are concerned about what's happening in Gretna and St. Bernard and Jefferson Parish. And um, and there is, there are some stark differences in the ways that um, those parishes are being policed compared to New Orleans. Um, but I am aware of, of uh, the murder of Ronald Green. Um, and um, going back to your first question about um, accountability for the upper levels. So whenever you raise a complaint against a the captain of the Public Integrity Bureau or any deputy chief, or the superintendent, there is a memorandum of understanding with the Office of the Inspector General for the Office of the Inspector General to conduct that investigation instead of the NOPD. That is the first step in trying to ensure that um, higher level officers 
are being um, held accountable because it is very difficult for a lower level officer to conduct that kind of investigation against effectively their supervisors, their rank, um, and not feel like there's going to be re repercussions in their career. And um, the, the next thing I'll say is that it is hard to hold those officers accountable, often because it's hard for information that would hold those officers accountable to get out. Um, this is one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why we wanna have a 24 hour hotline available um, for anyone to be able to call, to be able to raise allegations of officer misconduct, because our hope is that if there's an anonymous way for people to be able to report what's happening, that we're going to get um, we're going to get more information about what might be happening within within the ranks. Um, and I'll be honest, a lot of our anonymous complaints do come from individuals who work for the NOPD. So, um, and it's because they don't feel comfortable giving their names out, but they they do want to speak out about what's happening. Um, it also touches on some employment concerns that might be better suited to be investigated by the EEOC or a state arm of the EEOC for um, discriminatory purposes. Um, but um, it is hard. Okay, I would like um, one more, you know, so, you know, comment is that, you know, I think Valerie was trying to alert to it earlier that we, you know, people are just fed up with the training you know, the abuse of the taxpayers' money, you know, we constantly saying train, 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 and we still getting the same results. And, and really, truthfully, things have really gotten worse. Mm -hmm. um, now, my, my concern is, is that, you know, when are we going to consider, you know, something different? I apologize. When, when are we going to consider something different other than, um, you know, things that we have done in the past, like citizens oversight when it comes to the hiring practices. You know, I really feel strongly that if we had citizen oversight and we were the ones that were vetting people for these jobs, you know, we can get our leadership, you know, our, um, you know, community involved with the interview process. And also, you know, the application process, you know, what are some of the questions should be on the applications, you know, and the interview um, questions, you know, instead of just doing the same old stuff, you know, it's, it has to change. Um, that's a very interesting idea. And it's one that I think some jurisdictions are exploring. Um, to different degrees is how involved can the community be in hiring decisions and um, how involved can the community be in recruitment decisions. But I will say that um, even the term community is, I, I sometimes don't like that term just because what community, a community according to who, there's going to be people that are going to to stand that are going to to potentially flood some of these community events and say, why aren't you arresting more? Why aren't there are people that are going to demand certain practices that are unconstitutional or are going to bring their own agenda into um, policing? And um and we see it, you know, a community, there isn't one community. We don't speak with one voice that we all get to like rise up and say, this is what a good candidate looks like to us. There's gonna be just as many people that are gonna be saying that they want someone that comes from a military background, who's going to talk about how do we bring in facial recognitions, drones, stop um, and frisk. How do we get, you know, that version of police? We want police officers, who, you know, are respected and, and are given tanks. And then there's going to be people that are going to say, you know, I want a police officer that's very community focused. I want somebody who's going to use active listening skills, who's going to be reluctant to put people in handcuffs, who's going to be more willing to talk to the community and try to work through community issues instead of arresting. So everybody has different agendas, everybody has different priorities, and everybody has a different approach to how to handle crime and how to handle a police department. 
And ultimately, this is why it's so difficult. And these are some of the problems that you see with some of these jurisdictions that do end up having civilian-based decision-making models is ultimately it's very difficult to decide who represents community and, um, and, and whose voice is going to be heard on these types of boards. And, um, and then how do you ensure that these boards stay accountable to whoever they're supposed to be representing. So it's like, who watches the boards, you know? Um, well, well, uh, you okay. know, I have, a, I have a solution to that. I'm sorry. Okay, wait a but... okay. uh, excuse mm -hmm. me, Ms. Belinda, your, your statement, your comment is very important, but our time is first spent and it's time for us to go. So please forgive me, Ms. Belinda. Please. All right, Valerie, no problem. Thank you. I'm going to send you my email. Please feel okay. free to email me directly. Okay, thank you. I okay. do. I just put I, it I in the chat. That. Okay. Thank Everyone you. should feel free to email me directly. Any other additional thoughts, questions, or comments that you might have from tonight or ideas, articles, anything you want us to consider? You know, we're Good, good, good. Yeah, good. Everybody see uh Miss Stella uh information contact information in the uh chat. Please write it down and put in your contact for you can uh, uh email her for any questions, any statement, any uh comments. I'm sure and more positive that she will answer you back. Uh we really appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to leave with this note. Please put your um announcements, uh your contact information in the chat for we can um, uh, add you to our email address and put your uh, announcement in the chat. And I want to ask um, who, um, uh, Richard, who no, Jeff, I see Jeff. I want to ask Jeff, uh, will you please close us out, but give me this one minute uh, commercial. We are asking everyone, please, please um, be aware of your surroundings, be safe. And if you have any concerns or any comments, any, uh, statements you want to make about our forum tonight in reference of research of the uh, police department superintendent, please contact Miss Stella, please contact uh, Jessica Beyond, and we will get your information out. I we will try to get you some information and the right person to contact. You are very important. Most of all, you are created by God himself. Therefore, that you are important to us as well. Uh, we go ask... Um, uh, any other pillars have any statement or uh, 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 questions or uh, concerns you want to get issue out to the public? Because it's time for us to go. So we're going to ask. Um, um, Valerie, Jeff. I just have a brief announcement. I just want okay. everybody to mark down August the 5th on your calendar. Uh, we're going to be having a community forum. And it's going to be um, informing and educating the Louisiana families. Uh, about the available resources and also um, awareness um, for the D, the, the Department of Children and Family Services. We're going to have a panel with the Department of F Children and Family Services to um, educate us on their available resources and any questions that the public may have. Uh, Belinda, can you... Uh... Can you send us, can you send Jessica on that information? That's, that's very